Excellent. Well, thank you very much for the invitation. Uh, it's a pleasure uh, to be here and sharing a little bit more about my research. So today I'll be talking a little bit about map hydroblocks, and I know some of folks are already familiar um, with the approach, but I would like today to dive a little bit more in details and connect with some of the challenges uh, and opportunities we have um, in using machine learning and artificial intelligence. Um, Okay, so uh, one of the biggest challenges for soil moisture in carbon and many hydro hydroclimate process is that they are high, they have very high spatial and temporal variability over land. It's fairly different from atmospheric process where a lot of things like a mixer up there. Um, we have very big gradients of moist and wet conditions, very close um, one from each other, right? So um, if we look at, for instance, this domain, 36 kilometers, uh, here on the site, we can see that um, if we compare, and even if we have a few in situ observations available over the site, they are very highly um, representative of all the spatial variability uh, over the domain. Um, satellite observations can help us um, get a more accurate sense of what's going on, but their footprint is still way too coarse um, to represent uh, um, this variability, right? We can attempt to better understand how soil moisture varies in space and time uh, through uh, land surface models. But even then, even the state-of-the-art models right now are still uh, highly computationally expensive to run the field scales. Uh, we're gonna have like 10 kilometers or some uh, offline land models running at one kilometer resolution, but the computation expense is huge, uh, particularly if we're thinking on like ensemble simulations and so on. But at the end, the, the processes that we care about and many of the applications we need soil moisture for happen at the sub-kilometer scales, right? Um, so there is a huge um, spatial scale mismatch right now to the scales that we observe this process, the scales that we can model them, and the scales that the process um, actually happen, right? Um, and this spatial scale mismatch further complicated biases, right? So even if we have a estimate of bias between models um, and satellite observations, as illustrated uh, briefly here between um, the red lines and, and the blue lines. This bias at the point level or at the, the, the sub-kilometer scale, they might be very far off from, from what both models and, and, and satellite gives us, right? There's a lot of uncertainty. These errors will change over time. Um, and most, in, we often start with uh, approximations uh, of what these errors are based on the statistics that's run over a few available uh, sites and observations across the domain. Um, traditional uh, land data simulation approach have heavily re relied on methods that were initially developed for atmospheric process. Um, so many common filter-based approaches tend to carry a lot of memory uh, from process and probably and that's fairly okay for the atmospheric process where you have some not as critical changes, but in soil moisture, um, as you can show here in this uh, gray line illustrating a soil moisture time series, you might have a very steep uh, changes in process with very short memory uh, carrying. So developing methods that can enable us to reconcile this like memory um, changes is a, is a challenge as well, right? And another thing is that often the traditional approach tends to neglect the bias uh, between satellite observations and, and models, like I illustrated this here with this green uh, shader over this um, uh, over this illustration. And like this bias carries information, you know, and that could be information related to hydroclimate uh, antecedent conditions, to human activities such as irrigation specific uh, properties of the soil, specific vegetation types, uh, the state of the vegetation, and so on. So as of right now, besides um, multivariate DA, it's really hard to integrate um, some of this ancillary information into the directly into the simulation approach to con further constrain the further constrain the errors and uncertainties we have in this um, in these estimates, right? So if we want to be able to effectively obtain and use soil much information to add the terrestrial water grant challenge that are often localized and happen at very fine scales 
we will not need to be de developing methods that we can effectively reconcile. Um, again, these skills you observe, that we model, and that the processes um, actually happen, right? So one way that we have been working on is through um, through uh, is through the development of subgrid tiling schemes. Um, one of the approaches we developed is called a hydro blocks. The, this approach effectively uh, harness uh, big environmental data sets that describe the heterogeneity of the landscape. And through clustering analysis, we can identify um, what, what some communities will call clusters, hydrological response units, or tiles, right? But the effectively idea here is how can we use clustering analysis to define and identify a computational mesh, right? Such that we can couple this computational mesh or use this computational mesh with any physically resolving land surface model, right? So um, in previous research, we have um, coupled hydro blocks with no MP um, land surface model. And these are, uh, enable us to effectively model energy, water, and carbon process at effective 30 to 100 meters spatial resolution. But then instead of modeling every single 30 meters grid cell, we would model this process at the cluster space, right? So you, you move from the regular 2D, uh, 3D space, and you move to an abstract domain of um, cluster space. And we have demonstrated these capabilities uh, of improving subgrid sub tiling scheme and clustering analysis through um, hyper-resolution uh, soil moisture simulations over the continental United States. This is an example um, over the US uh, for the year 2017. You can see uh, how we can capture with a lot of realism in details um, how water interacts with well, the soil. Uh, and with the atmospheric uh, dynamics, right? So, but these are just models and we still have this, uh, the, the big elephant in the room, which is the spatial scale mismatch, right? To the scale that we can model process and we observe them. So one approach that we, uh, that we have been working on is how can we, can we take these fine scale model simulations of soil moisture and combine them with core scale observations? Uh, of uh, brightness temperature, right, or soil moisture. So one way we did is through using, for instance, um, radiative trans, tau omega radiative transfer model to simulate, if we have 30 meters soil moisture, can we mimic what would be the 30 meters brightness temperature linked to the soil moisture using a tau omega radiative transfer model, right? So now, now in hands of the fine scale brightness temperature and the coarse scale brightness temperature, we developed uh, what we call a cluster-based a spatial Bayesian merging scheme that I'm going to go into details in the next slide to effectively take into account the biases um, and errors in both of the estimates to uh, obtain a fine scale, um, a, a, a more uh, optimal uh, brightness temperature estimates. But again, there are errors in models, there are errors in, in satellite observations due to uh, confounding factors over, over the land, such as vegetation, soil types, and so on. So what we did was to use in situ observations to train a machine learning model to learn what are these bias and these errors um, and effectively use this training model to constrain uh, the data simulation approach. I'll get into the details uh, in the next slide. But once we obtain this uh, merged brightness temperature, we can feed it back into the uh, radiativity transfer model to then obtain uh, soil moisture estimates at the 30, effectively 30 meters resolution, right? And the beauty of this approach is that both the modeling, right, of the soil moisture process here with hydroblocks and the, and the data fusion, um, the, the data fusion here happens at the cluster space, again, not in the 2D space, which uh, enables us to reduce the dimension of the system for both modeling the process and assimilating this process by 300 to 500 times, right? We are reducing matrix sizes here from like 10,000 elements to 500 elements, which is um, a pretty substantial um, um, contribution for uh, computational efficiency uh, of this process, right? So how is this uh, spatial uh, Bayesian merging scheme put together? So effectively, you have the fine scale brightness temperature, right? For each different tile or cluster, as illustrated here, we have observation operator that you can think here as a linear operator um, that will take into account this, the spatial variability of some moisture defined scale and upscale it to the observation scale, which, which we have here as the bright, the map, our brightness temperature, right? So 
given the biases between the upscaled um, brightness temperature from hydro from hydroblox model to its map, right? We can identify their differences, and often we can split them into anomaly biases in in, in long term bias. Um, traditional DA will often neglect the bias because Bayesian origin schemes um, in, in Gaussian process in general do require uh, models and observations to be um, biased, but there is value, right, to this bias here. So what we did was to effectively construct uh, the equation to, to, to combine, right, both the anomaly and the bias in a separate way. What we saw is that when we did different combinations uh, of the data simulation, different locations, in some places, the anomalies were adding a lot of value. In some places, just the bias were adding value and so on. So we were pretty confused of like, what is driving the different changes in contribution um, of SMAP observations into, into our model simulations, right? So what we did was to include two constraints here, what we call, um, W short and W long, so they're pretty much nudging parameters. And the idea here is how can we use now uh, machine learning to effectively learn from data what this constraint should be, right? So what we did was to collect, uh, to use um, about a thousand uh, ground in situ observations available over the United States and train a random forest model based on the, on, on this, on the bias in brightness temperature, bias in soil moisture, um, vegetation optical depth, elevation, slope, um, soil types, and so on, um, and effectively train this random forest model to learn what would be the optimal nudging coefficient for the seasonal bias contribution and the short-term anomalies for each of these in situ observations um, over the US. These are what we call the training um, in situ sites, right? So. And once this model is training, since training, since the day the predictors for these variables are available um, at the continental scales, we can effectively apply this model to map what would be now um, the contributing factors at everywhere um, in the US. So now we can effectively apply this uh, data simulation merging using the W short and W long parameters that we learned from ancillary data in, in soil moisture in situ observations. But the interesting uh, thing of part of this approach is that we can actually look into these maps and interpret what we can learn uh, from the data and from um, the process that are going on. So what we can see here, for instance, um, there is a large contribution of SMAP seasonal bias, is particularly heavily irrigated areas over the like Mississippi floodplain, over the California Central Valley, the northern uh, part of the central US, right? But also at very dry um, locations such as the Southwest. And that's because models are, land models typically are very bad in representing irrigation process, but also extremely low conditions Models struggle with very dry um, soil moisture conditions. Um, so this is where uh, satellite observation can add a lot of value. Anomalies, on the other hand, add the values more um, spreadly in many locations, out very much also in the dry, over the dry Southwest, over the irrigation, uh, irrigation fields in the California Central Valley, most of the agricultural area of the US and so forth. Not as much in the Mississippi uh, floodplain, that's because it's Irrigation over there is mostly um, a pad field, a uh, ricey paddy field. So you have more like a constant, a constant irrigation uh, signal that's already captured on the bias with, with anomalies not adding uh, much value. And another interesting uh, feature that we're able to observe here is the low contribution of both SMAP biases and anomalies at uh, heavily vegetated areas, such as most of the, the northern, uh, the northern eastern of the U.S. Right, so there's also these limitations on sensors that sometimes we're not gonna be able to capture and assimilate that information into our models and data streams might be degrading um, the quality um, of the signals, right? We can also look into uh, the predictor importance uh, for training these models. So for instance, here what we found is that uh, soil moisture bias adds, uh, the bias between the model and the satellite observations adds the most 
uh, value, vegetation opacity, the fact that we saw a moisture value uh, and uh, biases as well, as well as other factors such as elevation, the latitude, slope, uh, hydraulic, hydraulic conductivity of the soil, soil types, um, and so on. So we can effectively start to learn what are the features and characteristics of different places and how are they playing a role um, in, in, in improving or worsening the errors and biases in our data simulation um, estimates, right? I one minute left, no. One minute left, right? So yeah. I have some, some validation results, but I'm going to um, try to be very quick, quickly here. Uh, what we, if we look into the KG score with respect to his map of four, we see most of the added value um, of this constraining the biases and parameters into heavily vegetated areas and irrigated areas as well. Uh, we see large improvements in the spatial, spatial temporal variability um, of um, soil moisture process in general, but there are still challenges, right? In our approach, uh, when we developed uh, this nudging parameters for uh, short-term and long-term bias, they were static, but as shown here in, our, in my green uh, illustration, these biases and anomalies, they vary over time. So that's, that needs to be handled as well as with the different memory between um, short-term and long-term process, right? So opportunities for that relies on integrating multi-sensors as well as um, using recurrent neural networks, for instance. One of the approaches we're developing now is to integrate uh, vegetation now into the GFDL Earth system model, following the same uh, approach um, that I introduced. It. I'm not going to go into detail into the vegetation today, but the idea here is how can we use novel methods such as uh, long short-term memory AI models that can better constrain different memories, but also directly integrate uh, this ancillary data that tells us more about the errors and the bias um, into this process. And the goal is that this would eventually support uh, um, national efforts for um, uh, weather and, and climate forecast predictions. And I, I just wanted to um, conclude with a very, a very quickly outline of some of the challenges we often think of co uh, cold and data, but I think uh, there's so much more behind the, uh, our current challenge for using artificial intelligence um, for the AI, but also opportunities, right? So clustering analysis on big data to define subgrid tiling schemes is a huge opportunity to help bridge the spatial scale mismatch and the computational expense. Right, cluster-based operators might help us as well bridge this uh, spatial scale mismatch more effectively. We can learn more from bias uh, and errors between models and process using ancillary data and situ observations that we showed in there, as well as can better account. We can better account for human activities and underrepresented process in these models. Challenges still remain because we to train these models we do need extensive ground measurements, so we still do not have a uh, very comprehensive uh, ground measurements cover over the US. There are still challenges with sampling strategies for AI that are often overlooked in most of the literature right now. The way you sample training data for traditional machine learning is not the same way we should do for a geoenvironmental process because they're spatially correlated, right? Um, opportunities again in with recurrent neural networks approach for better account for short and long-term memory process. And I think one of the opportunities, one of the challenges is the lack of software and hardware uh, that we have in our current land models and numerical weather prediction schemes that are built on legacy code. And but so we do need to start to port um, our software to modern language. And I think the efforts from, from Jedi, for instance, in as well from the NoMP community to transition the codes from fraternal to modern C language will we'll definitely help us move forward uh, with building and bridging these two different um, communities with uh, land data simulation. When with that, I thank you for the time.